welcome to History File. This unit, aimed at students in the 11 to 14 age range, focuses on the First World War, using a powerful combination of archive footage and detailed documentary evidence. The programs bring home to students the real effects of the war, from the battlefields to the new societies that were born in its wake. An additional program, Make Germany Pay, looks at the fortunes of Germany between 1918 and 1929. The Great War, which began in 1914, was to be the war to end all wars. In the four years that it lasted, it became the First World War. But what started it? There are many reasons why the First World War broke out in 1914. Some reasons, like the resentment between France and Germany, dated back many years. Others, like the rivalry between Britain and Germany, were quite recent. But most discussions about the roots of the war lead back to one man, Germany's ruler, Kaiser Wilhelm II. Wilhelm wanted to be seen as a strong military leader because the army had always been very important in Germany. He also wanted Germany to be respected as a world power. He was an unstable man and very unpredictable. And he constantly needed to prove himself. Many people put this down to an accident at birth and his upbringing as a small child. The accident had left him with a withered left arm, caused him to be partly deaf and affected his balance. No kind of weakness could be tolerated in a future Kaiser. So Wilhelm's parents tried many treatments, from electric shock to a special brace. These had no effect on his body, but affected his personality. In spite of his physical problems, his parents were very strict with him. Wilhelm's tutor, Dr. Jörg Hinzpetter, was ordered to make no allowances as he taught him to ride. When the prince was eight years old, a lackey still had to lead his pony by the rein because his balance was so bad that his unsteadiness caused intolerable anxiety to himself and others. It had to be overcome, no matter what the cost. Therefore, I set the weeping prince on his horse, without stirrups, and compelled him to go through the various paces. He fell off continually, Every time, despite his prayers and tears, I lifted him up and set him upon its back again. After weeks of torture, the difficult task was accomplished. He got his balance. Wilhelm was a grandson of Queen Victoria, and during his holidays, he was sent to visit her in England. There, with his British cousins, he would act out old battles in a specially built playground with trenches and a miniature fort. He grew to know Britain well and was jealous of its empire and, above all, its navy. 
he wanted his own empire and navy to rival Britain's. When as a little boy I was allowed to visit Portsmouth and Plymouth, I admired the proud English ships. There awoke in me the wish to build ships of my own like these someday, and when I was grown up to possess as fine a navy as the English. At 18, in spite of his arm, Wilhelm joined the army. There he said he found his true home and family. Before I entered the regiment, I had lived through such fearful years of unappreciation of my nature. The officer corps provided me with joy and happiness and contentment on earth. In 1888, at the age of 29, Wilhelm became emperor of Germany. He had always been told what to do. Now, he would take his own decisions. I alone know something. I alone decide. In the 19th century, an industrial revolution had begun in Britain. By the beginning of the 20th century, Germany and the USA had taken the lead in the development of new technology. All across Europe, electricity had turned night into day. Motor vehicles had changed the speed of travel. And aircraft had defied gravity. In Germany, much of this new technology was used to help the armed forces. New guns were made for the army, and by 1905, a huge fleet of warships was being built. But in 1906, Britain launched a new kind of fast and heavily armed battleship, the Dreadnought. Wilhelm didn't want to be left out. He was going to have as great a navy as Britain's. So Germany announced that they would build four dreadnoughts. Britain wasn't going to be outdone, and soon the two countries were involved in a naval arms race. The great German landowning families supported the build-up of the armed forces. Like the Kaiser and his generals, they believed in German supremacy and wanted a German empire to rival the empires of Britain and France. But not everyone in Germany agreed with them. In just 30 years, Berlin had changed from a town of 700,000 people to a thriving city of over 2 million. The factories had attracted thousands of workers but they weren't interested in empires. They wanted a share of Germany's wealth and a better standard of living. This didn't matter to Wilhelm. He rejected the workers and their calls for reform. He and some of his generals began to talk of war as a way of pulling Germany together. Britain and other European countries were very worried by these tensions in Germany and by the Kaiser's erratic behavior. In the years before 1914, everyone was talking about war. Germany had only come into being in 1871 after a series of wars. Since then, it had kept out of war through a series of treaties and alliances with the other great powers of Europe, France, Austria-Hungary, Great Britain, and Russia. But Wilhelm had other plans. The Kaiser felt he represented the new Germany. He wasn't sure where his country was going, but with him at the helm, it was going full steam ahead.
He allowed Germany's treaty with Russia to lapse, and soon afterwards, Russia and France joined together in their own alliance. Britain had stayed out of European affairs for a long time, but threatened by the new German Navy, they also joined the alliance with Russia and France. All of Europe felt Germany was preparing for war. Germany now had only one reliable ally left, Austria-Hungary, ruled over by the aging emperor Franz Josef. But Austria had its own problems. It was rivalry in the Balkans, the area which was called Yugoslavia until recently, that led directly to the crisis of 1914. Here, the Kingdom of Serbia bordered the Austria-Hungarian Empire, where many Serbs lived. Since 1912, Serbia, with the support of Russia, had doubled its size. This threatened Austria. Nineteen-year-old Gavrilo Princip was a Serb extremist and a member of the Black Hand. This secret Serbian society wanted to force Austria from the Balkans. On June the 28th, 1914, the heir to the Austrian throne, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, paid a visit to the city of Sarajevo in one of its provinces, Bosnia-Herzegovina. At 11 o'clock, he came face to face with Gavrilo Princip. The murder of the heir to the Austrian throne was the last straw for Austria's ruler, Emperor Franz Josef. He was determined that Serbia should be eliminated as a political force in the region. He ordered an investigation into Serbia's responsibility for the assassination and said if Serbia refused to cooperate, Austria would invade the following week. But Austria needed help if they were to carry out this threat. They looked to Germany for support. The Germans were happy to oblige and promised to back Austria. This promise brought into play the established alliance system. Austria-Hungary and Germany were allied against the other great power bloc, Russia and France. War between Austria and Serbia would mean war between Austria and Russia. That would mean war between Russia and Germany. That would mean war between Germany and France. And that might mean war between Germany and Britain. On July the 29th, 1914, Austria attacked Serbia. In Russia, the Tsar Nicholas was urged by his military commanders to take action to help their ally, Serbia. They told him there was no longer a choice. Russia must mobilize. Think of what an awful responsibility you are advising me to take. Think of the thousands and thousands of men who will be sent to their deaths. Tsar Nicholas was the Kaiser's cousin, related again through their grandmother, Queen Victoria. 
he attempted to avoid war by sending a telegraph to Wilhelm. I beg you, in the name of our old friendship, to do what you can to stop your allies from going too far. Nikki. To the Tsar. With regard to the hearty and tender friendship which binds both of us from long ago with firm ties, I'm exerting my utmost influence to arrive at a satisfactory understanding with you. Your very sincere and devoted friend and cousin, Willie. But events were now moving too fast for ties of family and friendship. And by 4 p.m. that day, Nicholas mobilized his troops. Russian mobilization was just what the German general staff wanted. Now, Germany could mobilize, saying it was being threatened. Over a few days in early August 1914, the nations of Europe fell into war. August the 1st, Germany declared war on Russia. August the 3rd, Germany declared war on France. Deciding to invade her old enemy through the neutral country of Belgium. Now Britain had to decide what to do. On August the 4th, 1914, Britain declared war on Germany. Germany now had to face war with Russia in the east and with France, Belgium and Britain in the west. Most of Europe was now at war. Many old conflicts and rivalries between countries had come to a head. Archduke Franz Ferdinand was murdered in the battle to force Austria out of the Serb lands it had occupied. France and Germany had a lot of old scores to settle over borders. And the Kaiser was anxious to prove that his country was bigger, better and stronger than those of his cousins, Tsar Nicholas of Russia and George V of England. But there is no one cause or person to blame for the outbreak of World War I. Each nation thought they were fighting a just war to defend their own country and beliefs. <laughs> 